Welcome uh, Julian Togelius. Uh, Julian is visiting us from uh, New York. Uh, he is one of the writers of the first book together with Georges Chemakakis. You all heard um, Julian speak uh, in the pre recording last week. Uh, and before we start uh, this day's talk, I wanted to ask you if you have any questions. If not, then I would like to give the word uh, to Julian. Yeah. Um, thank you, Maria. Great to be here. And please feel free to ask me questions about, um, about the recorded talk you saw or something else or basically anything. I must admit that I'm a little bit embarrassed to admit that I cannot quite remember what I think I said in that talk, but I think it's some kind of general overview. So um, uh, I'm happy to do this almost entirely interactive if you want to, if you have questions and if you have ideas and, and stuff like this. Um, but if no one has something they want to start with, I have some slides to show. Um, uh, and I'm not hearing anything, so I should probably... Oh. oh, am I supposed to hear something? No. Okay. Uh, I, I mean, I heard you. So I will just go on and screen share. Um, I was, I'm a bit annoyed because I have some slides that are in Google Slides and I cannot insert the video I wanted, which is very annoying. But, uh, uh, Julian, if you're able to multitask, yeah. uh, we have a question uh, yes. uh, from one of the students who's asking, could you give us a bit of a background of what you work with currently? Ah, great. Um, it's a multifaceted question. So what I did work with or what I do right now? Um, no. Right now, <laughs> or both. Yeah. So as I might have said before, I um, I used to come from a different angle. Um, uh, I came into artificial intelligence via philosophy and so on. And now for most of my career, I've been doing AI for games um, and games for artificial intelligence. So I've been sort of um, um, doing this in various aspects. Um, and I've been doing a lot of work and playing games in different styles. I've been doing some work on um, a sort of modeling player experience and modeling player preferences and so on um, and, and capabilities. Um, but then I've been doing a lot of work on generating game content levels, um, quests, uh, items, rule sets, or all kinds of things like this. So I think right now um, I have two different hats. I'm a professor here at New York University. Um, and I'm also a um, co-founder of the video game um, AI startup, Model AI. Let's start with Model AI, so MODL.AI, because it's easiest. We're a Copenhagen-based startup. We're 35 people or so right now. Um, and we started with the idea that we would be able to commercialize um, the kind of research we've been doing um, for a long time into, um, uh, in, into AI for games. And it turns out that it's very hard to do this as an independent uh, startup that needs to actually have customers and sell something. So we tried a lot of procedural content generation, and it's very hard to do this in a generic, generalizable way because because the um, because the different um, different games just look so different, and they have different uh, sort of affordances and different uh, assets and so on. So that was, um, we, we did some really good work. We worked with uh, um, King on generating Candy Crush levels, for example. We did work with a bunch of companies I can't name because of non-disclosure agreements and so on, but it wasn't really generalizable. So what, what we focus on now is game testing. How basically help you do quality assurance of a game using AI-based testing. And it seems all of the large game developers are working on this um, these days. Um, but the beautiful thing is that we're sort of focusing on medium-sized game developers, not building their own solutions. And I would say it's going all right. Um, 
it's a hard task and a lot of it is much more software engineering than just artificial intelligence but given that 10 to 20 percent of a typical game production is quality assurance um a, i think there's a real um there's something real um, 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 some real value to be provided there and it's also great because some people worry about what ai will basically um I think it's a completely unfounded worry, but basically that AI will uh, make um, creatives um, uh, um, jobless. I don't think that would happen. But in any way, if we're trying to uh, automate game testing, no one wants to do game testing. So it's great. Um, everybody's happy about this. <laughs> in, my, in my academic lab, so we have around 10 people or so in my academic lab at New York University. What we do there is mostly um, um, a content generation. So inventing new ways of generating levels and um, uh, and um, and uh, sort of other kinds of content. Um, and also some amount of like content generation together with game playing agents, this kind of open-ended learning loop where you train a game playing agent to play a game better. You generate new versions of the game or new levels that make, that are harder to solve. And then you train a level to be able to solve those levels etc cetera, etc cetera, and try to get to some kind of more open-ended learning of intelligence that way um i have some slides prepared although i'm happy to go in any direction you want me to but i have some slides prepared on um, new work and content generation text scatter content generation um okay question here from moby hazard um uh, could you describe how in broad terms ai could be used for quality assurance yes um AI can be used for quality assurance. One big thing is basically just exploring the game space and trying to find states that lead to failure in different cases. Um, so trying to find as many different situations in the game as possible and flagging those that um, lead to like huge um, uh, CPU um, um, uh, utilization that crash the game in some way or that makes you fall through the geometry or um, that basically mess up the rendering or a bunch of things like this. All these kinds of glitches you see in games, so get, states you can't get out of where you're stuck, for example. So I'm sure you've all played some kind of game where you, where you have some kind of glitches you wish weren't there and that they make the game look ugly or even unplayable or something. And the goal is to sort of partially automate this, automate the detection of these as much as possible. Of course, then you as a developer need to fix it afterwards, but yeah. If, is it like you train the AI to act like a player or is it more like you train the AI to stress test? So what I just described was more like this latter stress test. Um, but there's like this kind of a sliding scale um, uh, between a, just pure exploration and then, then exploring the game more like a human would all the way up to playing the game like a human would. And humans play games in different ways. So you want the diversity of capturing different play styles. I would say we're working across all of these, but the product that is out now that you can actually download in Unity as a store or app store um, is um, more like stress testing, more like, you know, sort of exploring as much a game space as possible. Um, right. I think if there are no more questions, I'll go on to some slides here. Uh, Yes, pieces. Yeah, yeah, there's one more. You saw yeah. it. Yes. Um, and yeah, so I'm going to talk about some versions, some new. So basically, we have several main prompts of research right, um, right now in the lab. One that is based on um, generating uh, like iterative sequential level generation, where you do basically you create levels and 3D environments and so on, one step at a time by iterating through them. And some of it using reinforcement learning, some of it using a new algorithm called the path of destruction, which is a very poetically named thing. It's a, a little bit like a diffusion model. Um, and it, another branch is using um, uh, large language models. And let me talk about that, and then we can go back to more QA afterwards. Mm -hmm. maybe. Let, let me just read out the question aloud. Yeah. Uh, so the question was, could you describe how you guys work to develop new PCG system or and algorithms? Yeah. 
and and basically yeah how we work is an interesting question it's a whole lecture on itself but um <laughs> <laughs> basically we try i mean a lot of it the, the beautiful thing working in academia is you don't have a customer or something like this you can basically start thinking about things that sound, uh, just sounds interesting and and and, and basically uh, i'm very often driven by like huh here's a weird way of doing something no one seems to be doing this why not there must be something wrong. Let's test it. Um, <laughs> and that's how a lot of stuff happens. So let me see here. Um, share screen. If I share this one. Um, uh, and um, then we then we sort of uh, slideshow this. Can you see my screen? Uh, yes, it's still loading, so it's black, but I, I think it's working on it. Okay, um, I will. We could I, we could see it before you you hit play. I'll I'll basically just share the full screen. That's probably easier. Yep, yep, we can see it. And I made a mistake by using Google Slides instead. Oh. Uh, something else because this wasn't okay now good right um so what i'm talking about here so i just threw this together from like a conference talk we had um last week um at a triple e conference on games um because this is kind of a hot topic take scattered level generation so you all know the, these um beautiful models that can generate text from text they can generate images from text and so on, can you generate game levels from text? And game levels are in some ways both simpler and harder than say images. Usually simpler because you have a set of assets, so it's kind of low resolution um, and harder because the game levels actually need to function. Um, and also because you don't have anything like the amount of training data and because each game is different, etc. cetera. Um, so actually it's much harder <laughs> in that sense. So. <clears throat> us and a couple of other research groups um, have uh, looked at this recently um, and uh, posing a couple of questions such as, can you at all generate game levels from text? Can you train a model that takes text in and, give you, and gives you a model? Now, how versatile can it get? How free form can your descript descriptions be? Um, how much data do you need to train on? And, and do we want to do this using a large language model? I'm taking it that you all understand more or less how, what a large language model is, not necessarily the internals, but basically a large language model like ChatGPT, GPT-4, Llama, um, Claude, um, et cetera. Basically, they take text of strings as input, um, and then they output text um, in uh, strings of text. Should we use the LLM to actually produce the output? Or should we only use it to encode the input? Um, so I'm going to show, show you examples of each, uh, both like using the LLM for the whole thing and using LLM to encode um, a, uh, a encode what you wrote and then use it in training another level to take that input. <clears throat> so first question here, can we use it using only an, 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 a large language model? Yes, it works. Um, but it's maybe not optimal in some senses. Um, so, um, so here's again a, a paper from uh, earlier this year. Um, we did this last year and it was published at the conference back in March, where we basically do the very, very basic thing. Like let's take levels of this game, Sokoban, and try to train a large language model to generate more levels. Um, uh, how, how much do we need to train it on? Can we control it? Can we give it prompts that sort of tell us what kind of level we want? And this is Sokoban. This is one of these classic um, puzzle games. If you have seen this, you're probably playing this in your head already. You're this little guy over here. Um, Sokoban apparently in Japanese means warehouse worker. So it is literally about pushing boxes in the right place. So you need to push these boxes. Um, here's a box into the goal. Here's the goal. Um, and uh, currently I'm like, is this even playable, this level? 
Yes, I think it is. <laughs> um, so, um, so the nice thing with these levels is there are relatively few tile types, and they have um, uh, they have and they're relatively small. But they're very puzzly. Levels that look exactly the same but one tile change can be unplayable. Um, so it's very much about being able to to really generate these. You kind of need to trace somehow the possible solutions um, to make a good level. So first of all, we just converted this into, um, a, or like the, there is a data set called Microban, um, where um, we, um, they are just encoded as text. Here's like the outer walls. Here is the player. These are boxes you can push. This is floor. These are goals. And you remember each, it must be possible to push each um, uh, box onto a goal but the path can be really long and complicated. And then we calculate the like proportion of empty tiles and solution length. These are two things we try to um, control for. Um, solution length, we calculated in the very complicated, I mean, using just like uh, a star search in a kind of um, stupid way. So it took a lot of compute. That's why the levels aren't bigger because um, solution length calculations um, scale exponentially or quadratically, not sure which one. I think exponentially with level size. Um, uh, so it is um, uh, uh, you kind of limited in, in in doing this. But what you want, you probably want a good hard level. is deceptively simple. It looks simple, but it has a long solution length. Um, and then we calculate how many of these are novel, how many of these are playable. Um, so this is. Um, a, a level generated by GPT-2 in this case, or fine tuned GPT-2. Um, and then there's a nearest level using edit distance. So we basically look at how, um, um, uh, which is the nearest one we have on the data set. And if it is too similar, we throw it away. We want something that is at least, I think like 10 tiles different or something, which this one is. Um, and then we check it for playable and so on. Now, if you just fine tune GPT-2, you take GPT-2, which is a three and a half year old language model architecture, and it's ancient by today's standard, and it's tiny, it's like one gigabyte or something like this. Um, and then we give it different sizes of the data set. And it turns out that eventually you can get a level generator that does really, really well. It generates um, novel and playable um, uh, Level, um, um, levels at a really, really high uh, proportion. And it's also very diverse. All the output is different from the other. So that's very, very nice. Um, um, but uh, it requires training on a huge amount of data, like um, uh, many thousands of levels. So that was not so good. But the surprising thing here is that if you use GPT-3 instead, and same thing, just basically fine tune it. And here we have a much, much smaller part of the data set. And we also apply some, uh, we did in the previous one as well, some data augmentation, flipping it, rotating it, and so on. Um, you can get this to doing really, really well with a smaller amount and with a much smaller set of the data set. Interestingly, you can then train it because we did train it not only with a level, um, or the level is the output in the training set. The input is these two things. We're saying proportion of empty tiles and solution length. So then you can ask it for um, levels with a certain proportion of empty tiles and levels with a certain um, solution length. I think I don't have a slide for this, but it's actually controllable. You can ask it, like, give me a level that basically is like mostly empty and it has a short solution length. Sure, here you go. Here's a, and chances are this is going to be playable and um, a novel. Um, so this is pretty interesting. Um, one interesting question is why does GPT-3 do better on this? Does it actually pre-train? Does it actually use something that's um, something that is a trained on to do this? Has it learned some kind of generic mechanisms that allows it to um, uh, solve this better or not? We don't know. Um, at the same time as we did this, so this is Sebastian Reese's lab in Copenhagen. Now, I talk to Sebastian um, uh, several times a week um, because he's also involved in model and we just like, I don't know, gossiping. Um, 
weirdly enough, we had we were working on exactly the or very similar things and have not mentioned this to each other. So um, the day after um, the submission deadline for a conference, Sebastian told me that, hey, I just submitted this paper. And I'm like, aha, I just submitted this paper on exactly the same thing. <laughs> so here they did a different architecture. Um, they actually extended GPT-2. Um, uh, they, um, they froze a decoder and trained and froze an encoder, trained a new decoder um, to have Super Mario Bros. levels, also encoded as text. And it's also built on GPT-2. And they give these instructions as text, like they can have many or little of pipes, enemies, blocks, and low or high of elevation. And these are the string, these are the sort of text strings that describe it. And it generates pretty good levels. They use a couple of tricks. They basically in a data set um, uh, also include uh, Mario's path and so on. And they chop it up in different ways. There's been a lot of work on the Super Mario Bros far too much work in Super Mario Bros, but it's just very, very convenient. So this is another data point saying that this is actually doable and you can you can get decent results. There was also a competition that I was peripherally involved in this year at the Conference on Games on writing prompts using ChatGPT um, to create um, instructions for how to create levels for a version of Angry Birds, which for Trademark issues is called science bars, but it's basically we mark we make Angry Birds. This sounds very complicated, but it actually works. Um, you can get get ChatGPT to do this, but it requires them having all this other infrastructure. Now, as you hear this, you may you may ask, like, can you also um, just ask ChatGPT to produce a working Sokoban or Super Mario Bros. levels? And the answer is no. Um, at least as far as we tried. We tried basically in context learning. Hey, ChatGPT or GPT-4, here's a couple of examples of Sokoban levels. Make me a new level. And um, it does not work well. Um, basically, most of it is unplayable. Um, and also, at least ChatGPT or GPT-3.5, if you ask it things like um, how many... <laughs> How many uh, boxes are there? It gives you these wildly inconsistent answers, which is very strange. Um, one theory about why this happens is that it's a tokenization issue um, because uh, the internals of language models are such that you don't actually feed them characters. Characters are tokenized, and a token can be a different can mean a different number of characters. And it this could be messing up with this ability to do this. Um, but it also might be that some of these things that are needed, for example, in Sokoban levels, you need to trace paths. And this is just genuinely very, very hard to learn for a transformer. Um, we don't know. OK, so procedural content generation by only a large language model. Does this work? Yes, it works. Um, it's very data hungry. Um, it's um, both. And we can do this both with fine tuning and in context learning to some extent. Fine tuning really, really um, improves things. Bigger models work better. Um, you saw the results with GPT 3. Representation is important. How we actually turn this into text is important. Can we do this? Can, does it scale in terms of both the number, the size of levels, and the number of constraints? Um, so that we um, explored in a new paper that was um, presented last week at the IEEE Conference on Games. We call it Practical PCG Through Large Language Model. So this is basically, this is Mohammed Nasir, who is in South Africa, but working with me um, because that's how things end up again sometimes. Um, uh, so basically, what we're doing here is that we're looking at LLMs, they're applied to everything. Um, and um, we can, of course, we can apply it to anything represented as sequence of tokens. Um, so here we approach, here, this is a new approach to this basically, where we have some human feedback in the loop with novel levels. And we also have this thing called, um, we use boot uh, augmentation of the levels because we only have 60 levels originally. Um, and uh, that are made from 2D artists of a game. Um, we have augmentation, um, uh, data augmentation, flipping and rotating and so on, human edits and bootstrapping. Bootstrapping is 
one of these techniques we used before that sounds like it should almost be illegal, but isn't. Um, basically, what you do is that when you get good output from the model, and this is like this place, check it basically passes all the tests and is different enough from anything you have the data set. Well, then you just put it back into the data set. Like, like a cow that basically throws up its food and chews it up again. I was probably a very misleading metaphor, but um, but basically the idea is that it's basically training on the sound output, which sounds like, you know, don't do this. But it turns out if the output is good enough, this becomes kind of a guiding signal, like, yeah, this is good stuff. Put it back in a training set, now can now and train some more, consider and consider that this is kind of stuff you should do. So um <clears throat> Metavoidal here is a roguelite brawler. It's a, you know, think of um, <clears throat> slightly Hades or Diablo-like or something like this. Um, and uh, I haven't actually played the game because it's in early access. And But basically, um, or beta or something like this, you play, You I think you're rock musicians and you need to escape a corrupt church. And the antagonists are monsters. Um, and it's, uh, and it's uh, made as rooms connected to lobbies, and we're regenerating rooms. So the metavoidal game um, is playing, it's not playing. Sorry for the sound level here. And sorry for it not playing at all. This, I actually blame Steam. Yeah, um, so, um, I mean, looks good. Looks like my kind of game. Um, I don't know why the full screen, where it went here. Anyway, so that's Metavoidal. So we have, um, uh, uh, so we have all these rooms, which are somehow part of a corrupt church. Um, and no comments on this. This is what it looks like. These are the rooms created by the two D artists. They look much better with the actual game graphics than it does with um, um, uh, as text, um, basically. Um, and uh, we have sixty of those. Um, we flip and rotate and everything um, to sort of augment the training data. And feed it into GPT three together with together with prompts. Um, so basically, there's like a bunch of different types of world tiles. This is also part of the augmentation. We make um, versions of these different tiles. We basically um, we augment the levels by sort of making versions of if there is a le level that has um, wood patterns and then moss marble walls. Um, then we also make a version of that level by automatically swapping it to marble patterns and marble walls, for example. Um, <clears throat> so basically, it sort of um, automatically um, increases the size of the size of the training set. Um, they have a lot of constraints. I'm not going to go through this here, but basically, the message here is that. Um, uh, uh, making a good metavoidal level that is actually playable, you need to adhere to all of this. So part of this is like, can we find you in GPT-3 to actually um, uh, adhere to all of this? We're obviously not giving it the constraints. Well, that's not so obvious. Honestly, you could have given it the constraints, but we're not. We're basically putting that into the fine tuning. Um, uh, and the prompt here is, so it's a much more involved prompt than the, for the previous ones. So the, it says like the size of the level is 10 by eight. The base tile is and ma marble mass. The border tile is bricks. There are two pattern tiles um, and this one and this one. F is the border tile. So we're basically telling it all this in English. Um, and then for each level in data set, we're pre-pending this, um, uh, this prompt. Um, and then basically to um, make a new generate new levels, we feed it a new 
never before seen uh, prompt and ask it to generate a level that corresponds to this prompt. Um, and here's more augmentations, rotations, flipping. These are fairly standard in lots of computer vision and so on. Um, but the swapping the pattern tiles is not standard. That, that we, we do that here because we know what the tiles look like. Um, uh, and then we have this process where basically we have prompts appended to original data, fine tune GPT-3, check, and we have one round of looking at humans, like do they, um, do, do humans like these? And if not, fix them. And then we put it back in. And then we do multiple rounds of like fine tuning it, checking if it um, and corresponds to all of the constraints. And if so, we put it back in. Um, so it's, uh, it's a complicated process here, um, but you can keep doing this. It turns out that this is somewhat expensive, um, not super expensive, but somewhat expensive because at the moment you can only fine tune GPT-3 using OpenAI's API. You cannot download it and use it. These days, this was done a couple of months ago. These days you could probably download Llama 2 and get very similar results, um, but um, uh, on your own machine. If you have a very big machine or if you ran some Amazon instance in the cloud, you could do that. But here we used OpenAI's API. Um, and uh, the same thing with novel and playable. Basically, the more rounds we do of level generation and basically training it back on its own input, um, the proportion of novel and playable levels in the output goes up. And we do get a bunch of, this is not rendered with the same um, graphics in game, but we do get a bunch of different um, uh, levels that the designers of the game thought looked pretty good, basically. Um, we have a cross for some reason. Um, so this kind of works. Um, it works pretty well, actually. It works better than what we have before, but it's a more elaborate procedure. Um, uh, yeah, we can, use human in loop LLM generation, we can generate novel and playable levels from a not so big data set. Um, 60 levels is okay, you can make it by hand. Um, it's much better than the thousands we needed originally. Um, and these are pretty complicated constraints. So, and it turns out the GPT-3 can be tuned to actually handle these. Um, okay, last thing I'm gonna talk about here is uh, Paper that got quite a bit of um, um, uh, quite a bit of uh, attention recently. It was uh, got a lot of spread on social media and was written up by um, New Scientist, was a um, science magazine, and so on. Um, so this comes out of a different project. So we have an ongoing project to try to use something like reinforcement learning by human feedback on um, uh, on game content generation. Um, and as part of this, we wanted a simple, lightweight framework for generating game levels from text. And we have been experimenting with a lot of really complex things. And then um, this is a fairly big team in my lab. Um, and we were um, uh, trying all these fancy things. And I was just like, no, you do a super simple thing. Just do a text encoder um, and then basically do like a, a feed forward network from the encoding to the output. Um, and so this is unlike the previous approaches, this not, does not use um, the LLM and the LLM for the output. It only uses a simple, simple LLM. Um, it's a language model. I'm not sure it's even a large language model um, to encode the input and then uses another architecture for the output. And we try this, and this is called the $5 model because Tim and Rome and the two first authors were bet one of them were betting the other $5 that this is not gonna work, it's too simple. And so one of the other, what was the other guy? A beer, I guess. Um, could barely get a beer for $5 in New York, but yeah. Um, so here's um, some of the generation. This is, this is what we get out. We have a tile set of different tiles. Um, and, uh, and then we have prompts, which are, if you compare to the previous prompts, which were very kind of utilitarian, a level which are this size with these things in it, blah, blah, blah. These are much more poetic in a sense. A stream surrounded by a forest and a field of red flowers. An island with a house surrounded by a ring of red flowers. Home by the river. 
home by the river. We all want to be home by the river. Um, and uh, the house at the edge of a forest with a stream flowing by. And it actually looks pretty good. Um, so the way we did this was that we had a number of people um, use this little editor with uh, where you could basically place tiles. We actually gathered them using using Twitter. If you remember Twitter a couple of months ago, it was a useful social network um, <clears throat> before someone decided to run it into the ground for un hard to understand reasons. Um, and uh, basically, we had people write the descriptions and then sort of make these little um, uh, these little um, levels. And we trained on that. So we have a different architecture. Here we have a sentence embedding. We got this from a version of BERT, which is a extremely ancient architecture from something like 2018 or something, I think. Um, uh, and it's very lightweight. Um, it works on anything. It works fast on your phone or something. We had a noise vector. And, and then we use a, um, a convolutional architecture, partly, um, and a couple of residual blocks um, to generate this output. So this is not an LLM. None of this is an LLM. There's another very, very small LLM that basically put, comes up with a sentence embedding. And then we have this very, very fast architecture. This runs in milliseconds on like um, a mobile phone, like an old mobile phone. It's it's very fast. Um, and we get, here's where I wanted to include a video, but um, that did not work because Google Slides somehow. So let's do this one. This is what it looks like. Does it, let me see here. You see it there? Yeah. So this is rendered in Unity. You basically come out and you describe where we're we going now. A grassy field with some flowers. It's a great place, right? Um, and uh, you get a grassy field with some flowers. A beach. This guy can walk on water. Um, I'm sure that happens. This is of course the same output as you saw before. It's just rendered with a um, more flattering rendering um, uh, because uh, people like when you have nice 3D graphics, you can scroll forward. These things go on here. We have uh, can generate buildings, fences and stuff like this. Um, and people have been reacting a lot to this, saying that this is very nice, and it is nice, um, but it's also dependent on that we have a relatively constrained set of tiles, um, uh, and uh, um, the, the constrained tile sets make this much easier to learn. Um, we also have like gathered this stuff from online, from um, from uh, we have a couple of hundred small maps that people have made using a little editing tool. And a large part of the success here is that um, we, um, uh, the editing tool was fun to use. So people just did it because it was fun. But then again, lots of games have fun editing tools um, and lots of like user-made content that um, could um, actually be used for training. Another important thing to look at this one is that the fact that we don't, it's not like a language model in and out. It's like a small language model encoding the text. And then we have a, um, <clears throat> a, and then we have sort of a sort of bespoke particular architecture for the, um, and, uh, to generate the actual levels makes a big difference, both in terms of quality and crucially in terms of, uh, a, in terms of speed. Um, this stuff is this kind of stuff can really run real time on uh, in 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 a regular small game with no particular requirements, which is not true for um a, a lot of um a lot of language model stuff, which is just big and unreal and slow. Um, and the last one um uh, is that um, uh, presentation matters. It's a good thing to think about when you do your own prototypes. Anyway, that's the slides I have, but we have more time. So I'm happy to sort of, you know, keep the discussion, open the discussion and about this thing or anything else you want to hear about. Thanks, Julian.
this was really interesting. Uh, so since you had people on Twitter try this, can we try it? Um, probably. Yeah. I mean, even because Twitter, uh, some somewhere there should be um, there should be a link. Um, I can try to. Um, yeah. See if you can paste it in the chat. Yeah. If I can find it, it's somewhere on M's. Um, uh, we have okay. Here's like um, some map creation, um, which is basically where you um, um, uh, do your own stuff. And then we had a follow up thing where people generated maps and then fixed the maps as well. Mm. Oh, here's the sprite generation version of it. Actually, it's great if you do this. Um, if you get this working, um, we're going to use your data for um, uh, crazy <laughs> purposes. Um, you, you will be part of the training set. Um, Sorry, I just yeah. needed a, a scratch pad here. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> um, and there's... The repair data set is even better. If I could find it, um, the repair experiment. Um, uh, and, oh yes, here we go. This is the even, there, there's three three versions of this experiment. The last one here is kind of interesting because basically um, it's, um, let me let me share the screen here. So basically it is, um, uh, you are, um, you, you write a prompt and it generates a map and then you fix the map. Um, and you basically use the uh, fix the map to basically um, uh, by moving things around or adding things around. And then we're trying to learn fixing models um, that try to sort of basically um, improve this somehow. And this is very analogous to what's called reinforcement learning from human feedback in language models. Um, where you basically get different versions of an output and it learns based on which one is best, um, which is very effective. Um, and we're trying to see if we can make this work here. So um, um, yeah, if you could provide us with some end data here, that would be awesome. And it's fun. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that it, it looks really interesting. We haven't covered uh, reinforcement learning yet. We're only on the uh, second. Right. Uh, week of the course. So uh, just to, to all of you here in, in this room, that some of the terms that might seem unfamiliar will seem much more familiar to you in, in a month or two. So don't worry right. about that. Yeah. And th the nice thing about much of this research is that it's fairly easy to get into because everybody has used a language model. This is kind of uh, a low threshold to go to, to try a bunch of things here. Um, so that's uh, so I can... If people are interested in this, this this is this is a fertile area where everyone is like trying things right now. Next year it won't be. Yeah, I think we had a question uh, in the chat, uh, which is: Have you worked on PCG or three D models like props, characters, etc.? Yes, um, we've done this in various points. I've done. Oh, but I'm not gonna dig up those slides now because they're like deep somewhere in memory. Yes, we worked on various kind of three D, three D rocks, three D caves, three D, um, three D, lots of stuff. Um, what I could show you, um, if you wanted to see, let me dig this up here. Um, this is some stuff that isn't published because it was done largely as my um my student sam was um working on uh working at meta and i was involved in this as well so generating text guided um 3d minecraft um uh, so basically here um this is a um a tool that basically does um takes free from text and generating Minecraft structures. And it builds an existing there in text to 3D NERF methods. NERF stands for neural radiance fields, um, uh, which is a very fascinating way of um, a, taking a couple of different shots of a 3D object and then getting like a real object, getting a 3D reconstruction, which is in this thing. 
here. But basically, and then it's trying to make this into Minecraft structures through a basically a complex process of discretization. And we're working on making this um this is like this is like ancient old wizard tree or something like this, um, made in my so made by this thing in Minecraft. So it's pretty big. It's bigger than we saw before and it's 3D. And this is a pirate ship that unfortunately has some issues with that it's um with <laughs> with perspectives, <laughs> but it works. This stuff isn't currently available online for like uh, lawyer reasons, but it will be soon. Um, uh, yeah. Um, I've also done stuff on generating 3D caves on the GPU and stuff like this. Um, uh, they often use quite different things. So this is like, the architecture here is like, has more in, in common with a $5 model, but it's um, just very complex and very heavy um, in many ways. Stable diffusion was part of the pipeline of this, which we had to take out because Manta's lawyers weren't happy with that in favor of another um, text to 2D. So there's a text to 2D to 3D basically happening to Minecraft. So it's a complicated pipeline. Um, um, but there are lots of, not everything is language model. Um, uh, I'm gonna see if I can find um, there's um, stuff that we did um, in the past. This is sharing, right? Yeah. Um, where, where we basically um, looked at cave patterns, typical cave patterns, and tried to come up with um, terrain generation that would work for this. So basically, here we use a grammar, a grammar that describes different movements you can make. Um, and then this grammar is being expanded um, uh, and using an L system. Um, you get these 2D shapes that become uh, 3D shapes. Um, well, no, actually, these are 3D shapes from the beginning. And then we use, this is not, this doesn't say meatball. It's a meta ball, which is a structure for, it, it's a version of like taking a straight um, line and making a nice cave um, structure out of it. Um, and then eventually we have some nice pictures coming up here of like, um, nice caves um, that you can go inside and they look, um, this is a Vedos package, a passage. Um, again, presentation matters a lot because these are, um, when you when you render it nicely with nice nice shaders and in, a, in a game engine, it looks so nice. But um, uh, the basics of this is actually pretty, it's, it's pretty, the basic algorithm methods are pretty sort of straightforward and old fashioned. Um, basically grammars. Grammars are very useful for um, a lot of generative topics. So yeah, this is some 3D examples. I'm mostly working 2D. Actually, we have some recent um, um, work on PCG using reinforcement learning for 3D, but don't have time for that. Uh, so yeah, sorry. We have a, a question uh, here in the chat, which says, that's awesome. Uh, what would you recommend for a beginner to start with uh, to research the dabbling in PCG for 3D structures like these? Since it's so complicated. Good question. Um, So there's some stuff we're working on that we haven't released where we're trying to build Lego. Um, we're generating Lego structures. And when we release this, it's gonna be a nice kind of framework that people can use to sort of build their own things with. Um, and we wanted Lego because it has irregular shapes of various kinds. Um, and, uh, and that would help us, but then we don't have this out yet. Um, hopefully later this year, we're gonna um, release this. In the meantime, I mean, there is the PCG RL environment, um, which if you like, um, let's see if I can actually, uh, um, environment, like framework. Um, so this is probably a good starting point. This is for 2D stuff, um, but we have 
ways of connecting this to Minecraft. Um, and Minecraft is a pretty good environment to work in, um, in many ways. So you could start from here and contact Ahmed or Sam, uh, who you can find through that page and seeing wh where, where you can get the Minecraft interface. That's what I would recommend. Hmm. I've been uh, taking uh, and copying these uh, links. So do you have, when you do this Lego uh, work, do you have contact with Lego about it or? No, no. It, it turns out there's this huge um, hobbyist, um, uh, yeah. huge amounts of hobbyists that basically make 3D Lego simulators um, that is not affiliated with a company that basically have gone through the catalogs, cataloged all the different pieces and lots of the kits and so on, and basically have um, mm. uh, built their own software that basically does um, a, a rendering and even some structure checking and so on, which is very cool. Um, uh, I forgot what they're called. Eldraw is one. What what are the, these things? Is called Eldraw, I think. Um, uh, we are working with it, and we'll. Oh yes. This thing here. Um, uh, so yeah, but Brian uh, is coming to talk here uh, next Monday, and he's at Lego in London. Mm, uh, interesting. I didn't know that either. Yeah, no, and and he's doing uh, some things that I think could be interesting for the work that you're doing. Uh, Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. So if you want another early Monday morning. Uh, mm. you can hop on uh, to this Zoom next week. Awesome. I might yeah. do that. I might do that. That's cool. See what he's doing. Very nice. <laughs> um, well, I think we're almost out of time right here. So Yeah. So does anyone have uh, uh, questions at this point? Then I just want to tell you something, Julian. I read this paper. Uh, you and George just wrote something like uh, like advice for depressed AI researchers. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I just wanted to like uh, tell you about that paper because it's like there's so much uh, computing necessary to do this uh, chat GPT yeah. uh, thing. I mean, insane things. Not even the EU can afford that kind of like uh, that, that level of investment to take. Yeah experiments hey, so I, too, I i have no money so i definitely can't afford it so <laughs> yeah no i mean it's it's like insane amounts of computing yeah. power. so julian and george just wrote a very nice paper saying that okay since you are if you're not actually at google or open ai what can you do instead what kind of interesting experiments can you do and outlining ways to do that and i just wanted to tell you that when uh if you are, when you do your exam works, if you're interested in dabbling in this area and do something really novel, have a look at that paper to get like some ideas of approaches. Thank you, thank you. I, I, I posted it in the chat. We had uh, so much discussion on it. I'm actually probably gonna use it myself for a lab se seminar soon and basically talk about, because what it really is about is like choosing the right problem to work on. Um, and it's is crucial to all kind of research to choosing the right problem to work on, and it's very non-trivial task. Yeah, no, it's it's not an easy one, uh, no. but that can give some leads. Uh, so Julian, it's almost five, and for you, it's nine, I believe, or no, no it's eleven. It's six hours different, so it's uh -huh. less... oh, 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 right, of course. You're, you're, you're... I, I'm going to jump yeah. into meeting with your section now, and then after that, I'm going to have yeah. coffee. Yes. Okay. Coffee. <laughs> okay, say hi to George's for me. Uh, and I'll see you tomorrow, I think. Tomorrow? Hog editorial. Oh, I don't have an yeah. invite for that. When is it? Yeah. Uh, it's uh, at six my time. I'm teaching when it's, it's for the Europeans. So, oh, so I'm going to be. Have... So much yeah. invite. Yeah, so so. For you. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. That That's. Uh, Thank you so much, Julian. Thank you. All right. Bye. Thank you. Oh, no, hey, <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, esqueci. Uh, 